Welcome to the webinar on Vital Signs Core Metrics, Reducing Measurement Burden. My name is Claire Wong. I'm a Senior Program Advisor from the National Academy of Medicine and your host today. This webinar is being recorded. A link to the recording, as well as a copy of the slides, will be posted on our website within the next week or so. This webinar is the second uh, in the Vital Signs webinar series. It is brought to you by the NAM Leadership Consortium, led by Dr. Mike McGinnis, also here with us today. Thank you, Claire, and uh, thanks and welcome to everybody that's on the line. Um, thank you um, uh, for joining in this conversation, uh, as well as uh, for your interest and work in your home territory uh, on behalf of um, uh, Better Measurement and Vital Signs. Uh, I want to give special thanks clearly to Claire, uh, to Nan, to David, to, uh, Lou, John, and Nancy, uh, our colleagues and partners in this work, and in Lou's case, uh, one of the authors of the uh, National Academy of Medicine report, uh, Vital Signs. Today's session focuses on the, the one of the key aims of uh, the Vital Signs work, that's reducing uh, the measurement burden by sharpening our focus on what matters most, uh, and uh, uh, with those uh, few uh, introductory uh, notes of welcome and um, uh, and appreciation, let me turn it back to you, Claire. Thank you, Michael. So measuring what matters most is an essential element to achieve the quadruple aim, better health, better care, lower costs, and stronger engagement. But with thousands of performance measures in use today, many of them lack consistency and alignment, has the proliferation of quality measures paradoxically limits their effectiveness. In the next hour, you'll hear from a distinguished panel of speakers who will present what we know about the role of quality measures in driving value and improvement, but also the burden on providers from measuring and reporting them. But first, for those who are not familiar with the vital signs, let me provide some background. Vital Signs Core Metrics for Health and Healthcare Progress is a 2015 Institute of Medicine consensus report since its release, the report has been downloaded more than 17,000 times from all 50 states in the U.S. and around the world. With funding from the Blue Shield California Foundation, the California Healthcare Foundation, as well as the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the then Institute of Medicine convened a 21-member consensus committee drawing diverse expertise from the field to identify a parsimonious set of core measures for health and healthcare progress. As Dr. McGinnis mentioned, you'll be hearing from one of our members, uh, Lou Sandy, later this hour. Next. The committee recommended 15 core metrics, shown here on the left, across four domains, healthy people and communities, high quality care, affordable care, and engaged people. Some of the measures are more mature with a large number of validated measures already in use in public reporting, quality improvement, and payment incentive programs. Other measures will still require further refinement and development, for example, measures for individual and community engagement, patient-centeredness, or healthy communities. For the vital signs to be useful, the community stressed that they have to add value to existing measurement activities, and the progress depends on the collective movement from healthcare organizations, payers and employers, standards organizations, and public health agencies. The National Academy of Medicine is actively working to put the vital science framework to use. We're engaging field experts to refine and update the 15 core metrics to capture priority concepts. We're building a vital science partners network to foster learning and sharing, as well as cultivating pilot implementations. Please visit our website, nam.edu slash vital science to learn more. There you can download the consensus report and other related publications, as well as access archived content, such as recording from the last webinar, which focused on a pilot project that implemented vital science in California. Next. Now, let's turn to our speakers. Dr. Nancy Dunlap from the University of Alabama at Birmingham and David Gann from the Medical Group Management Association. 
They will first present their research findings on the benefits and burdens of quality metrics reporting from the perspectives of health systems and physician practices. Nan? Well, thank you, Claire um, and Michael, for the opportunity to discuss our paper. As a bit of background, as the vital signs document was being completed, Michael asked if I would glean the perspectives from providers, primarily health system executives, to help better understand the benefit and burden of reporting quality metrics. The result is this um, discussion paper. Next slide. I had the opportunity to work with talented executives from the organizations listed here. The health systems were geographically dispersed and represented academic centers, large and small systems, and safety net organizations. Before getting into the burden of reporting quality metrics, I do want to say that every executive with whom I spoke believed that they had benefited and must continue to participate in quality metric reporting. So please do not let that important point get lost in our discussion to follow. Next slide. Participants included 20 health systems, two provider groups, two healthcare associations, and one health insurance executive. A qualitative methodology was used to collect interview data from participants in three areas the local healthcare landscape, burden of reporting metrics, and quality improvement resulting from metric reporting. Open and closed questions were provided to the executives in advance of the telephone interview. A subset of participants, these are the authors on the discussion paper, debated, refined, and finalized the points and recommendations. Next slide. All of the systems reported that metrics are mandated by federal and state governments, accreditation agencies, and commercial payment organizations. The executives questioned estimated that mandatory metric reporting, which was mandated for accreditation or payment, ranged in number from 284 to more than 500. In addition to metric reporting for outside entities, all of the health systems interviewed participated in collecting metrics for internal process improvement efforts. Other challenges included that many of these metrics changed annually, slight variations in the definition of the metrics posed by different groups result in an effort to reanalyze the diagnosis, condition, or outcome being evaluated or the population under consideration and the complexity of reporting metrics is increasing, requiring increasing staff. Next slide. The collection of data for metric reporting is not simple. Although all providers used electronic health records, the large majority of health systems and physician groups responded that only a portion of the quality metric reporting is automated. Documentation by the physician is crucial for accurate attribution and capture of information and often physicians must re-examine their record to clarify terms and ensure that all the relevant wording is used to describe the care delivered. Standardizing the documentation input into electronic health records can be helpful, but with changes in metric definitions, the data fields within the electronic health record must be changed and providers must be trained to document differently. Next slide. Quality metric reporting involves numerous people across health systems. Departments cited as participating include business intelligence, health information technology, clinical systems office, quality departments, nursing, clinical departments, plus many others listed here. Because a coordinated effort is needed to consistently analyze and report metrics, an infrastructure is required to efficiently manage the processes. Health systems reported that on average 50 to 100 individuals, these are collective full-time equivalents, are involved in this process. The range was from 12 to 120 FTEs. The number of individuals varied somewhat by the size of the organization and the integration of continuous process improvement into the workflow of the organization. The range in cost of personnel was estimated to be from 3.5 to 12 million per year, with most health systems reporting 5 to 10 million annually. Additionally, these institutions may spend a substantial sum to recruit and train these individuals. 
And with that, I will turn it over to David Gans, who measured the cost of reporting metrics from the physician perspective. David? Thank you, Nan. Uh, this is Dave Gans. I'm Senior Fellow for Industry Affairs with the Medical Group Management Association. Uh, I'm going to discuss the results uh, that, are that we're summarizing from an article that I uh, co-published in Health Affairs in 1995. Next slide, please. This was the results of a national study that the Medical Group Management Association with researchers from the Will Cornell Medical College conducted with funding from the Physicians Foundation. It was a quantitative study that looked at, uh, at uh, physician-owned and hospital-owned practices in four different specialties, cardiology, orthopedic surgery, primary care, and then multi-specialty. What we found was consistent information across all four types of specialties and consistent information whether the practice, regardless of ownership. We asked for time estimates by uh, different types of physicians in the practice physicians as well as staff members on different types of activities that related to the collection of quality measures, the reporting of quality measures, and then, of course, the use of the information. Okay. And then we utilized the standard costing approach to look and address the amount of time it took in these various functions to give a cost estimate. Okay. Okay. Next slide, please. What we found with looking at on a quantitative basis is that we had very similar experience as Nancy described on their qualitative measures of health systems. Okay. First off, we found a substantial amount of time was spent on collecting data. Okay. And it was done in various ways. Entering information was by far the most time consuming. And entering information occurred at individuals of all types of physicians. Physicians, of course, medical record staff, as well as nursing staff. What we also found is that there was relatively little time spent in using the information, but we found you know, substantial information as far as time spent in other ways. Okay. But the total effort, uh, looking at about 15 hours per week per physician in collecting and using and reporting quality information. Next slide, please. Okay. More importantly, what we found is what is the cost of this function? The physicians, even though they spent only about two hours per week because of their uh, much higher compensation level, had the highest cost. Okay. We found that the LPNs and medical and uh, medical assistants for the doctors spent much more time, but because of the lower salary, there was less, less uh, cost per year. But when we look at the total cost, you realize even in a very small practice, one or two doctors, this is a substantial investment of activity of, of, that, could other, uh, that could otherwise be used in a patient care environment. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. What we also found is that the cost of collecting and using and reporting quality metrics varied by specialty. Okay. Uh, all practices spending about $40,000 a year in the total cost per doctor, primary care, those specialties that actually may have uh, the least uh, you know, revenue margins of any specialty actually spent more money. And I think this is a result of the complexity of primary care patients and the wide spectrum of quality measures that a primary care practice will, will collect, report, and use. Okay. We also found that among cardiologists and orthopedic surgeons, that they spent less dollars because they were specialized and the collecting and reporting of quality metrics was much more routine as were the, the number of metrics used was far lower. Next slide, please. Now, unfortunately, what we also found is that, uh, that practices that uh, had a relatively poor opinion on quality metrics overall, for example, uh, measures, you know, that only 28% of our respondents answered that they moderately are very representative, felt that the measures actually rep actually represented quality. There was a consistent concern that the measures that were being collected were not relevant to their specialty. Okay. This was especially true in orthopedic surgery. 
we also found that 81% said they spent a substantial amount of time and effort. In other words, validating the information that we had collected and the quantitative aspects of the study. 46% okay. of our respondents answered positive that, the, that, the, that there was a substantial amount of the burden was due to multiple metrics measuring the same element, or that you had similar metrics by different payers that were reported that had different definitions or different aspects, such as different time, different time, as, time level, uh, elements in the reporting. And lastly, when we asked, okay, do you actually use these quality scores to focus on quality improvement, less than a third responded positively. So here we're looking at a quantitative uh, study that uh, says we're spending a substantial amount of time, substantial amount of effort, collecting information that may or may not be, and most likely is not, clinically relevant, okay, and therefore, and is not being used because it's not clinically relevant. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. Set up, summarizing the information, these were some of the comments that were made by our respondents, uh, consolidated around certain themes. Okay. As we said, as we found in the quantitative aspects of the study, the, uh, the responding uh, practices did not feel quality measures adequately represented quality of care. Okay. That it take, took a substantial amount of time, and that time could have been better spent caring for patients. Okay. Also, what we found is that some of the cost is due to duplication of effort by the, the request that uh, practices have by reporting entities, and that uh, if the measures are consolidated and standardized, this would reduce the burdening effort. Also, substantial amount of the work is still manual, that a well-designed electronic health record has the potential to collect and report the information in a more automated fashion, but that is not occurring in as broad a spectrum as it could. Okay. And lastly, our quality metrics are, are insufficiently specialty specific. And this was especially a concern among the orthopedic surgery practices in our study. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. Okay. Our findings are very similar to what Nan is going to report next, which is the, the overall findings from the broader health system study that, that University of Alabama Birmingham conducted. Nan, I'll turn it over to you. Although the two studies um, show sort of focus on different groups, they do show similar findings. First, that all participants, um, at least in the qualitative study, responded that the reporting of metrics was important, but the majority of participants felt that the number of metrics being requested was just overwhelming. Next slide. The themes that we found were first, the focus of quality metric reporting should be on process improvement. But there is no doubt that reporting quality metrics has changed the dialogue surrounding quality of care. But the reporting of a large number of metrics may be overwhelming and detract from process improvement efforts locally. So theme two is the number of quality metrics externally reported should be kept to a manageable level. Next slide. Budget neutral fee uh, perform uh, pay for performance programs can create a dilemma for inner city safety net and rural critical access hospitals. And therefore, it may be that different organizations may need fewer metrics on which to focus so process improvement can occur simultaneously. Metrics should be regularly evaluated to ensure that they drive actual improvement in care outcomes. Next slide. Alignment and standardization of definitions among groups requesting metrics are needed. To, this is to decrease the effort required to report slight differences in metric definition or population. Metrics should be piloted and definitions finalized prior to widespread dissemination. This is to ensure that the definitions are finalized so, so groups don't have to keep working them and metrics um, are actually measuring what is intended to be measured. Next slide. The last theme is that electronic health records should be designed to more easily collect and report metrics 
Um, and as we move away from quality metrics derived from billing and administrative systems, the clinical metrics would be more useful. Next slide. So in sum, we suggest that we prioritize, reduce, enable flexibility, evaluate, next slide, standardize, pilot test, and redesign the metrics. And with that, Claire, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Nancy and David. I'm sure your findings have inspired some questions from the audience, um, but because we have more than 250 people on the line right now, we ask that you type your questions with your name and organization into the Q&A box at your lower right-hand corner of your screen, and then click Send. Please note that any question you submit may be read aloud and included in our recording. While you do that, let's set the stage by hearing from the reactor panel. My first, question, my first question for the panelists, given what you heard from these two research studies, from your perspective, how are things actually going in moving towards the parsimonious, consistent measures that, measure, that matter most? Um, first to respond is Dr. Lou Sandy, Executive Vice President at the United Health Group. He's also one of the consensus committee members who authored the Vital Science Report. Lou, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, thank you, Claire, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today to react to what we've all heard. Uh, as mentioned, um, I, I did have the privilege of serving on the Vital Signs the consensus panel, and I want to, I, I think the first thing I'll say about that is I think the Vital Signs report is a wonderful effort that has uh, provided a focus for some of the themes that have already come out today, particularly around what are priority measures and um, what domains should be measured to really advance individual and population health and improve health system performance. So my take from the report, just a few comments on that, is among the most important um, contributions from the report is the domains um, that the vital signs identified as really key priorities or areas that should be measured. And then as part of that process, we also identified the fact that in many of those areas, there still exist measurement gaps where we just don't have good measures. It's not less, it's not so much that we have competing measures, we just don't have measures. So there's really an opportunity for um, improvement in the entire measurement enterprise um, as identified by the Vital Signs Report. Um, turning to the kind of the question then, about the state of measurement, I, the quote uh, that is next to my picture is kind of my summary of where we are, and I think it, it echoes and is consistent with what Nancy and David have presented, that our current state of measurement is really just too complex, it's too manual, and it's really not supporting enough improvement. Um, and I was really struck by both of the uh, research projects indicating um, given how much we spend in healthcare, how much technology we apply to healthcare, and the current state of technology and what we can do with technology, how much manual processing is going on, data entry, reporting, and so on. So I think um, uh, in particular, you know, on the issue of measurement burden, um, I think that's an area for significant improvement. And to answer the question that Claire teed up, where are we? I actually think there are some important efforts already emerging around issues of, of addressing measurement burden. Um, I had the opportunity to participate in a multi-stakeholder group across payers and care providers called the Core Measure Collaborative, which was aimed squarely at this. Can we actually develop a core measure set? Um, in areas like primary care or in ACOs or in certain specialty areas. So that effort uh, has been launched and is being deployed. Um, the NQF has a new strategic plan that focuses on priority measures and meaning, uh, increasing the meaningful use of measures, um, and John can speak to that um, uh, as well. Um, I'm actually speaking to you from the 
uh, Physician Consortium for Performance Improvement, or PCPI, a multi-stakeholder effort that is also focused on driving improvement through measurement. So that's an effort that's focused on uh, addressing burden and closing gaps in measures as well. And then from <clears throat> the United Health Group uh, perspective, uh, we operate, as many of you know, both United Healthcare as a national payer and Optum as a health services company. Both of those enterprises are focused in this area of particularly leveraging technology and data and analytics and um, focusing on how do we actually collect, analyze, and disseminate useful information to drive improvement. And we are strong believers in the use of technology. I kind of wince personally when I see David's comment about how much physician time is devoted to data entry. I think we could all agree that that makes no sense in 2017 and we can do better. So those are some of my eyes. So in summary, I think we, are, we have uh, these issues that I've outlined. There are initiatives beginning, but we have more work to do. Thanks. Thank you, Lou. Next, we will hear from Nancy Foster, who is the Vice President of Quality and Patient Safety Policy at the American Hospital Association. Nancy, what's your take? Thank you, Clara. I'm very glad to be on this call today um, and, and talking with all of you. I think, as Lou has suggested, it is really noteworthy that the Vital Signs Report um, provided a real foundation for discussion. In my perspective, the dialogue has indeed changed around the need to get to a parsimonious set. Uh, a few years ago, we felt like we were the only ones at the American Hospital Association who were calling out for a parsimonious set, but now there are many, many activities uh, all designed to help identify what are the most meaningful measures that will help drive quality forward. Uh, unfortunately, they're not all on the same page, um, so we, we have some ways to go uh, would be my conclusion, but let me give a little more insight into that. Uh, yesterday, AHA released a study on regulatory burden. In that study, uh, we showed that hospitals face an enormous burden in simply fulfilling the administrative tasks associated with compliance on a whole host of regulations. Uh, from CMS, from the FDA, from the Office of the National Coordinator of Health Information Technology, and from the Office of the Inspector General. Of course, there are many other regulatory agencies and oversight agencies that impact hospitals, but we were looking simply at those four. On average, we found that across hospitals, it's about $1,200 per patient for just the administrative burden of, of compliance. That's not taking the quality measures or any of the other uh, activities and using them to improve care. It's just how do you get the data together, review it, send it in when you're talking about quality measurement. It's how do you, uh, you know, ensure that you're in compliance with the conditions of participation and a whole host of other regulations. Of that $1,200, we found that uh, the quality measurement data collection and submission constituted about just over 9% um, of that. So a substantial burden for which every patient in America who's going into the hospital should expect some return. But as Nancy and David uh, suggested earlier, our administrators, our uh, leaders do not feel like most of the measures for which they are collecting data are having the desired impact on quality because they don't feel like the right measures, the ones that represent true opportunities to improve the outcomes of care. That's why we stay very focused on this issue of driving towards a parsimonious set that will actually improve care. The latest wrinkle in this for most hospitals across the country has been the fact that as hospitals and health systems continue to grow, and look to provide more integrated care, we are engaging in uh, with and, and partnership with a number of other organizations, uh, post-acute care organizations, uh, physician groups, and in fact, we employ or contract with um, more than 270,000 physicians across the country. 
each one of those organizations has its own set of measures. And the physicians have a large number of metrics for which they are being held accountable. That has added to the burden of data collection for hospitals and, more importantly, added enormously to the confusion and the dizzying array of data that's coming at people. Uh, we kind of joke that, uh, that, that there are uh, 50 of the top 10 hospitals in the country exist in California, um, making mock of the fact that, that, in fact, there's so many different appraisals of hospitals, it's really hard to tell where you're doing well and where you need to focus for improvement. We need to get on the same page, and there is plenty of room um, left for improvement on this. The vital science report laid out an incredibly important framework for this work, and we look forward to working with others to expand the influence of the vital science report and help it come to fruition. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Claire. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we will hear from Dr. John Burnott, Senior Director of Quality Measurement at the National Quality Forum. John? Well, thank you so much, Claire, and really thank everyone for coming on the call. I know everyone is very busy uh, today, and it's just striking to see how many folks are on, and I think it's a testament to the importance of this topic. Um, but as, as Claire mentioned, I am with the National Quality Forum, but like I think a number of other folks on, on the phone, I'm also a practicing family medicine physician, so I really do get to experience the realities of, of quality measurement on, both on the front line, but then also part of this community that's working to reduce the burden on, on the other side. Uh, but I think to answer the question that you posed, Claire, I, I'll start by reiterating that I burden of measurement is real. What has been presented is real, and it's a challenge to everyone in the field of quality measurement. But in support of what Nancy and Lou said, I do think there are now some initiatives turning the corner. I think the dialogue is changing. Um, progress is being made, uh, especially at the level of awareness, and, but a lot of work needs to be done to address the issue um, that have been raised so far. So we're trying to take a, a purposeful approach to this measurement burden, and I'm going to uh, piggyback on Lou's comment about some of our stri strategic vision that we've had, and just over a year ago, really tried to change this dialogue and, and put the focus on a few things, including prioritization of measures, the right measures, um, but reducing uh, unnecessary measures, and then also collecting that feedback um, and acting on the feedback from the field. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the details, but I do want to talk about just a little bit about a couple of focused initiatives, uh, one around prioritization of measures and the other uh, on acquiring feedback on measures. And really more important has been the response to the field than the initiatives themselves. Um, on the prioritization side, we're trying to take a very scientific approach uh, to actualize a priority, prioritized set of measures that should be used. Um, we want to highlight the gaps in needed measures, too. I think these things go hand in hand and are both very important. Um, and then the other element is really removing these ineffective or low priority measures from the public and private sector programs. All of these components, I think, go together to reduce the burden. We've presented this to a number of our members, to committees that we have here, and it's been overwhelmingly supported. This is, this is a component for sure of reducing burden and, and really have been asked to actually accelerate the initiative. Um, similarly, on the feedback side to this, uh, just constant input that as a field, we, we need to learn more about the measures after they've been implemented in the public and private programs. So, so it's a great measure, it looks good, and then it goes into the program, but what happens then? And we've actually, this has led us to actually change our measure endorsement process very recently to actually require the submission of feedback uh, regarding measure use uh, when measures come back for endorsement, um, for their maintenance of endorsement, excuse me, which is to be re-endorsed as measures. So, I, I really do believe to your question, Claire, that the, the prioritization feedback, these are really concrete steps uh, that are moving to, uh, towards that parsimonious set of measures and getting to the measures that matter the most. Um, 
Just in conclusion, I'll try to be brief with the comments, but I really do believe the field's maturing. I think that's a really good thing, um, seeing these, experiencing them firsthand. Uh, I really appreciate the, the focus of this important topic. Um, and as Nan and Nancy measure, both mentioned, that uh, these quality measures need to be integrated into the day-to-day -day workflow of the clinicians and the organizations. Um, the freestanding is, is probably insufficient, and that's adding to the burden. Um, but that coupled with, with having the right measures available will allow us to achieve the ultimate goal that we all share, and, and that really is just to improve health and health care for all. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it back to you, Claire. Thank you all. Um, now I want to open up to all speakers for your thoughts um, on the second question. How can the Vital Science Initiative and the NAM help accelerate progress? What would it take for the Vital Science to serve as the anchor point for payers and providers? Um, shall we start with you, Lou? Uh, sure. I, I actually think we're already seeing examples, as we've already heard, about how Vital Science, the Vital Science program, um, um, can be a, a springboard to accelerate progress. One example from my own organization, um, uh, we have a, a part of Optum called Optum Labs, which is a uh, collaborative itself to identify, use big data and analytics to um, identify opportunities for um, improvement. And um, that group, actually, when the Vital Science Initiative came out, they had a certain framework that they were using to organize, you know, what uh, the quality measures. They said, you know what, actually, we could use this vital signs framework and let's sort of restack how we're deploying our measurement schema to be in alignment with vital signs. So I think the whole one major area for progress here is to look at the vital signs report and the domains outlined in there as a way to promote prospective alignment for any change initiatives um, that come along. Uh, I think the other thing that the report has outlined, as I mentioned earlier, is that there are important areas that I think, one of the areas, I think one of the issues in this field and why we have some of the, I think, uh, the comments that essentially there's just not enough improvement or people don't think the measures are clinically relevant, um, I think there's truth to that because many of the things that are, are many of the measures currently um, available have the, the, are essentially there because they're measurable, not that they should necessarily be a high priority measurement. And there are other areas that really are pretty high priority in terms of individual and population health that um, actually we don't measure, and one of the reasons we don't measure is we don't have good measures, or even if we have a measure. We don't really have the infrastructure to have a scalable way to, to measure and improve in that area. So I actually think as these initiatives, the ones that Nancy has mentioned, the ones that John has mentioned, roll out, vital signs can, you know, basically I would encourage everyone to look at those reports, look at the gaps identified, and see if we can close those gaps as a way to make progress. Thanks so much, Lou. Um, Nancy, do you, do you have some thoughts for us? Sure, I'd be glad to. I agree with what Lou has just laid out as a as a way forward. Let me add a couple of additional possibilities for you. One of the hardest things to do is to stop doing what you're already doing. It may be possible for the folks at the National Academy of Medicine, those who are uh, still working on vital signs as it rolls out, to actually go through the list of measures that are currently used in a variety of programs and identify which of those might be kept because they are consistent with the vital signs report and which would be eliminated so that people have a very clear idea of what the impact would be of truly implementing the vital signs report. Um, and it may give some folks who are currently measuring something, have been measuring it for a while, the freedom to say, you know, maybe we need to move off of this measure and uh, and just focus on others that are more consistent with this national effort to be more strategic in our measurement. Um, and the second thing might be to take one or two of the areas that are 
the domains that are laid out in the vital signs report and sort of walk it through what what measures might exist in each of the for each of the different kinds of providers that would help to drive improvement in that particular domain in a very effective way cuz occasionally some we will see folks think that they're um reducing burden by using the same measure for different provider organizations or the same measure for physicians as for the hospital and the the locus of control the ability to influence the outcome of those measures is different for each of the different kinds of providers so it may not be appropriate to use the same measure for each it may be more appropriate to use a coordinated family of measures all helping each contribute each of the different provider groups contribute effectively to the overarching goal thank you and other thoughts uh, from the panel before we turn to audience questions all right um, well, in that case, uh, let's take a few questions from the audience. Um, I have a, quite a few questions coming in. Um, so the first one um, is from Kirsten Barrett um, from Mathematica. This is a question for Dave. In terms of the findings regarding costs, is the $15 billion cost a total cost? If so, What's the cost above baseline that is added as a result of the ECQM reporting? Well, th thank you for the question. I saw it when it was first posted. Uh, the $15 billion cost was a, a, a simple measure that we took the total cost, we, we identified what was the cost per doctor per year, doctors in active practice in the United States. Made a very good headline for our article, and I can see it had its effect. Uh, because what we find is that practices are spending a substantial amount of time and effort on reporting quality metrics externally. Now, uh, essentially, this was the cost above baseline that for uh, for for uh, you know, electronic quality measure reporting. Now, it's also interesting when we in our assessment we found that practices had two different types of quality metrics. One type was the external reporting. The, at the time of our study, of course, this was the PQRS reporting for Medicare, the reporting that many uh, commercial insurers have for their various quality bonus programs. Also, we found that many practices have internal quality metrics as well, that they're reporting internally and they're collecting data for part of their continuous improvement efforts. And this was widespread even among small practices, looking at how do they better, how do they better improve care for their patients. So we're, as we look at the external reporting burden, this is where it becomes important that those metrics, as we've just had discussed uh, from everyone on the panel, that, that, the, that those metrics be uh, relevant and also that they be in many ways uh, more automated as we have more sophistication in our electronic health records program. Thank you, Dave. Uh, next question is from Kathleen Blake from the American Medical Association. Um, I think this question might be for Lou. What is known or when will information be available about the uptake and impact on the burden of the core measures from the core measures collaborative? Yeah, thanks, uh, Kathy, for that question. The, um, uh, I do know that the, uh, there has been a survey fielded and uh, analysis has begun on that question um, uh, the, uh, to essentially ask uh, kind of the state of deployment of the core measure collaborative and for those who aren't familiar with it in terms of uh, once the measure core measure sets were developed by this collaborative uh, when it when the when that information was released it was understood that these would be deployed over time, particularly um, in the relationship between payers and care providers. There are uh, contractual um, agreements that, you know, roll over over a period of months and, and years. So the, the deployment was likely to be as contracts come up for renewal um, uh, 
as the quality metric portion of a contract would um, um, uh, be discussed, that was an opportunity. So my understanding is that there's been a, an initial wave of, of data collected and analyzed, but what I don't know, actually this is, um, this is work that AHIP has done, is kind of where they are in their analysis and release of that information. Thank you, Lou. Um, the next question, I think it's directed to the entire panel, um, and it's a combination uh, from a, a few of the audience members, um, including Ron Klein uh, from CMMI and CMS, and Doug McCarthy from the Commonwealth Fund, um, and, um, and Tim Fletcher. And so they're um, interested in your thoughts on um, what are the impediments that prevent quality measures from becoming more clinically meaningful? Um, any recommendations for what can be done to help practices make better use of data for QI, um, especially in terms of closing the gap on care quality? Well, this is Nancy Dunlap. I will, I'll tip this off because I think this is a very important question. Um, I think one of the barriers we have now is that the measurement um, of quality metrics is focused on healthcare processes and not necessarily outcomes. And the reason may be because outcome measures um, necessitate a more community involvement or other organizations, cross organizations working together. And it makes it much more difficult when you have um, a healthcare entity who, whose payment or reimbursement is based on specific metrics to partner with community organizations um, for larger metrics that may help the outcome of the patient, the quality of life, et cetera. But it, the health system is remiss and not um, wanting to be judged by what others are doing. I don't know if that was clear, but I think that quality, the vital fund metrics really are a higher level um, metric that we should be measuring, but it also requires coordination among many groups, including community organizations or continuing care organizations, as well as hospitals. If I could add to what Nancy has said, this is Nancy Foster. Uh, I think she's exactly right. And I, I would point to some of the areas where we've had great success in changing behavior that has resulted in better outcomes for patients already. Um, I think in particular of the reduction in early elective deliveries. And that was about having a measure uh, an effective measure to let us know how we were making progress, but it was also about having a compelling, important issue to be addressed. No one wanted to be in the place where they were unintentionally harming infants. Um, it was about having some good tools and and strategies for affecting change and sharing those practices broadly. And in fact, uh, the CMMI. Uh, work and the, the work out of the um, hospital engagement networks at the time, now HINS, um, really was uh, instrumental in helping many hospitals make a change in their early elective delivery rate. And the, the fact that the professional physician organization as well as other providers, including my, my hospital association, got behind making this change and advised their members that it, that it was necessary and stood behind the science. I think all of that came together in an important way. So measures are important. Choosing the right topics uh, for measurement is critically important, but those alone can't garner the change that we want. More is needed. Hi, Claire, and this is John. I, I would like to go and, and both support what Nancy and Nan have said about this, this clear need to move from the process measures to the outcome measures and, and all of the uh, impediments that Nan mentioned with the, the difficulty of assigning responsibility or attribution um, at, at a clinician level to an outcome that is really something that is 
section of the uh, entire system or, or care continuum that that patient may uh, encounter. Um, the other thing I wanted to add, one other point, though, that I think is improving but has been um, limited to date is, is the meaningfulness of this to the, to the patients. And I know that's not necessarily a clinical impediment, but I think it takes away from the workflow and really just the integration of this into what we do as clinicians. And so I think this is getting better. We're doing better with patient reported outcome. We're really trying to amplify the patient voice. But to date, it hasn't been there. And I think it might have been one of the reasons why things are not as integrated as they potentially could be. And, and it's a place where there's a lot of promise. And I do think that there's a lot of hope that these two will come together and really get us to uh, more meaningful clinical measures. Thank you, John. Lou or David, do you want to speak to this question as well? Uh, this is Lou. Two other things. I'll, I agree with everything my colleagues have said. Two other things I'd say on kind of how do we make progress in this area. I think one area is one of the challenges is that many physicians and other health professionals actually need to learn uh, the uh, the process of improvement and the use of data. I think there's, uh, in many areas there's kind of an assumption that all we need to do is compile data and distribute it and then improvement will occur. Well, improvement is a process itself and people need to learn um, uh, how, how to use it. Um, and then I think the other thing is that in terms of clinical, clinically meaningful, I think the push to outcomes is important and the other one What's most clinically meaningful to physicians and other health professionals is the, a sense of what are the things that matter to the to my patient and my and the care of my patient. So I think actually, again, coming back to the Vital Signs Report, there are many areas that focus, for example, on you know, understanding patient preferences. What are what are those, uh, and what is our ability to measure and improve the process of eliciting patient preferences? That's a real gap area, but I think everyone would agree that's really terribly important. So I think, again, uh, we need to align and move this whole measurement enterprise in a way that's more clinically meaningful both to patients and to the people that are taking care of patients. And this is Dave. I'll add exactly to what Lou said. And also that, you know, so often what we look at, measures, we look at those externally reported measures that are required by, by payers. And one of the problems, especially among physicians, is the short duration of the physician-patient activity when it's on an encounter basis, whereas there's typically a much more longer-term relationship with either an established patient in primary care or even for a, a specialist on referral where there is an a episode of care, we're typically not collecting those longer term elements for reporting purposes. And this is where you actually see outcomes. What we've observed at the practice level is those sophisticated practices that are looking at population health are probably far more apt to have true outcome measures as they're looking across their population of diabetics or hypertensive patients uh, or surgeons who are looking by, by type of case and looking at their overall uh, patient, uh, patient health status, again, those are longer-term measures that are not fitting very well in our current collection efforts because we typically are very episodically based. Yeah. But so there is, there is potential, but it's actually maybe not less so for, for external reporting more for internal activity. Thank you, Dave. Let's take the last question. I think it's uh, um, interesting that our conversation is centered around um, patient-centered outcomes, and that was also um, the questions from Tim Fletcher and others from the audience really wanted to know how can we move towards more of a, a patient-centric approach rather than provider-centric. Um, on the other hand, let me turn to the question that's raised by Neil Esposito. Um, in terms of payment, um, so how much presence in the future will quality metrics um, have when it comes to physician payment 
and, and uh, this payment driven quality metrics, would it be driven by the payer or the provider? Oh, well, this is Lou. I'll start. Um, I, I think uh, um, uh, it, I think it's very clear that we are continuing to move towards uh, a transformation of payment and delivery um, with more focus on um, paying for value as opposed to um, our legacy fee-for-service uh, reimbursement system, which rewards volume and intensity. Uh, I think that that system rewards volume and intensity, and so what we've gotten is volume and intensity. So if we change the payment model to reward value, um, that raises a whole other set of questions relating to measurement, you know, value from whose perspective. And I think it's important for all of us working in this area to be sure we have a broad view Clearly, those who pay for care have a point of view around value. Um, uh, those who are receiving care have a point of view regarding value, and those who are delivering care have a point of view regarding value. So all those need to be taken into account. Um, I do think what I'm most optimistic about and actually very pleased to see is that what we're seeing, I think, is essentially more, much more collaboration rather than arm's length um, um, transaction between payers and providers. As these new models develop and deploy ACOs, uh, patient-centered medical homes, the ones that work well, both in terms of demonstrated outcomes from quality metrics or cost metrics or whatever, uh, and qualitatively the experience is that when there's a kind of a collaborative back and forth, um, where both um, care providers and payers are essentially uh, working together and sharing their points of view, working it through, that's going to lead to better performance. So I actually think the answer is both. It's going to be some will be driven by payers, some will be driven by providers, but working together is the right way to approach it. Do you agree with that, Nancy? Which Nancy did you want? Uh, Foster? Yes, it's Nancy Foster. I do agree with that. I I, I think um, each perspective is critically important, not just payers and, and providers, but the public and, and um, others who are interested stakeholders here. We have a long way to go to getting to deliver the safest, highest quality care as we all want to be doing. Um, so good ideas, wherever they come from, should be recognized and used. And uh, there's some great expertise in a wide variety of organizations. We have to listen to all of it and, and um, identify what is ripe for moving forward now and how best to get that done. Thank you. Uh, looks like this is all the questions we have time for today. On behalf of the Academy, I want to thank the speakers for your time um, and for this inspiring discussion, and thank everyone on the call for your commitment to measuring what matters most. Please join the conversation and engage with us as we continue to expand our work. So today's recording and the slides will both be posted on our website, which will also include some additional slides with more information from the speakers within the next week or so. Also, do check out these related publications from the NAM and from our partners. With that, I'd like to thank you all again for participating and have a great day.